Okay. Looks like looks like most folks are in the room now. Well, I'm sure we'll have more people trickling in. Um, but I wanted to say hello and welcome everyone to today's event with author Ben Goldfarb. Uh, my name is Natalie Summer. I'm a PhD student and a LEAP fellow, and I'm uh, honored to be your moderator for today's talk. Um, before I introduce our speakers, all attendees should be aware that this event is being recorded. The recording will be published to the Yale Law Ethics and Animals Program YouTube channel, where you can watch this event and many other past events as well. I also have a number of groups to thank for co-sponsoring today's event. Uh, it's a big long list, including uh, New York University's Wild Animal Welfare Program, the Pointer Fellowship in Journalism at Yale, the Yale Animal Ethics Study Group, the Yale Animal Law Society, Yale Environmental Humanities, the Yale Environmental Law Association, the Yale Journalism Initiative, and the Yale Sustainable Food Program. So now it is my privilege to introduce Ben Goldfarb. He is a 2013 alumni of the now School of the Environment and an award-winning independent environmental journalist. You may have seen his writing previously in the Atlantic, Science Magazine, The Washington Post, The New York Times, National Geographic, Outside Magazine, and many more. Um, but you may best know Ben from his debut book on beavers called Eager, The Surprising Secret Life of Beavers and Why They Matter, for which he won the E.O. Wilson Literary Science Writing Award. I personally loved Eager, which is why I was beyond thrilled to read Ben's latest book, which we are here to talk about today, called Crossings, How Road Ecology is Shaping the Future of Our Planet. I found Crossings to be a superbly engaging look at all of the repercussions of roads and cars on the lives of wildlife all over the world, as well as a beautiful reflection on the scale of human influence over nature. So we're very fortunate to have Ben join us all today to tell us more about his book. If you don't have a copy yet, you'll wanna get it as soon as possible. And before I fully turn it over to Ben, I just wanna remind everyone that if you have a question during the presentation, please submit it directly to me, Natalie Summer, using Zoom's chat feature so I can read it during the Q&A. You can access the chat in the control bar in the bottom of your Zoom window. You will also be muted for the entire event unless you raise your hand at the end and you're asked to unmute. And again, if you have any questions, just let me know. And with that, I will turn it over to, to Ben. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Natalie, um, for that introduction. And thanks to the uh, litany of sponsors that I will not attempt to repeat. And thanks to you all for being here this afternoon. I really, uh, it's a, an, an honor to be addressing you. Um, so this this book that I recently wrote and, and uh, the talk I'm about to give is about the science of road ecology, which is basically the field of study that tries to uh, examine and quantify and account for all of the many different ways uh, that roads and really all of our transportation infrastructure uh, shape nature. And roads are so transformative, uh, transformative in, in large part because there are so darn many of them. Uh, there are about 4 million miles of road uh, in the United States alone, uh, perhaps 40 million miles worldwide, uh, and another 15 million miles uh, coming by the middle of this century. We're in what ecologists have described as an infrastructure tsunami, this wave of new construction, uh, a lot of it in places like Brazil and Kenya uh, and Indonesia and Myanmar. Um, and a lot of these roads are slated for uh, some of the last intact habitats uh, on this planet. So there are lots of roads uh, on Earth and uh, we're gaining uh, many more of them very quickly. And, you know, I think in part because roads are so ubiquitous and such daily staples of our lives, we tend not to think about them very much. Uh, and when we do think about them, we think about them um, in fundamentally positive terms, because of course roads do lots of stuff for us, right? They're how we get to schools and hospitals and entertainment and how farmers get crops to market and so on. Uh, and, you know, we have lots of positive connotations with roads. You know, we consider them symbols of freedom and human uh, mobility. You know, all of our sort of great mid-century writers and artists and musicians from Jack Kerouac to Bruce Springsteen have celebrated uh, the open road as again, this ultimate avatar of, of, uh, of, hu of human freedom. Um, but of course, paradoxically, uh, they do the exact opposite um, for basically every other being on earth, right? They're truly uh, ecological catastrophes uh, that curtail wild animal movement and mobility uh, on a, 
a truly massive scale. Uh, you know, and again, I think that like roads themselves, you know, roadkill uh, tends to be invisible to us because we've all driven by the dead squirrel or raccoon or, or white-tailed deer. So we tend to overlook uh, wildlife vehicle collisions as a true conservation crisis and catastrophe. But in fact, you know, more than a million wild animals, vertebrate animals, to say nothing of insects, uh, are killed in the U.S. every day uh, alone. Uh, it's, and it's not just those common critters like white-tailed deer and raccoons, right? There are more than 20 uh, endangered species for which roadkill is the primary existential threat from the Florida panther to the Houston toad to the tiger salamander. Uh, and in fact, ecologists have described roadkill as the leading direct human cause of vertebrate mortality uh, on Earth. It surpassed hunting uh, at some point in the 20th century. So there's truly nothing we do uh, that kills more wild animals on land uh, than, than drive. Um, and you know, and one of one of the reasons, and really maybe the primary reason uh, that uh, that roadkill is so destructive, uh, is that it essentially hijacks evolution. Right? You think about the sort of the common defense mechanisms of many of our uh, you know most beloved species, uh, which basically rely on standing their ground. Right? Turtles withdraw into their shells, and porcupines bristle their quills, and skunks spray. Uh, you know, these are all evolutionary defense mechanisms that were honed over thousands of generations and work really well when your predator is a coyote or a hawk. Uh, but you know, when it's an F-150 barreling down the highway, the worst possible thing you can do is hunker down, right? Uh, so cars have, have rendered uh, evolution not only irrelevant, but even uh, maladaptive, uh, which is kind of tragic to, tragic to contemplate, I think. But it's not just roadkill, right? Again, roadkill is sort of the most conspicuous manifestation of how cars and nature interact, but it's really in many ways the tip of the iceberg uh, when it comes to how our transportation infrastructure shape nature, shapes nature. You know, roads are vectors of invasion, right? Not lots of non-native species essentially penetrate ecosystems along a grid. Uh, this is a, an old logging road that I visited in Montana where invasive musk thistle seeds had been transported uh, in the patterns of, uh, of logging truck tires. And then all of those seeds sprouted at once. And now there's this sort of eerie purple linear strip of uh, non-native vegetation uh, along this otherwise wild mountainside, which is pretty, pretty surreal to see. Cars and roads are sources of pollution, right? Our, our cars are constantly hemorrhaging copper and zinc and cadmium and microplastics. And we're discovering more uh, about cars as pollutants constantly. Uh, recently, scientists pinned many decades of salmon die-offs in the Puget Sound watershed on uh, 6PPD, which is basically a, chemi a chemical added to tires to uh, protect them from ozone pollution. And all of those tire particles bleeding into the environment uh, have been killing salmon for decades uh, at a really massive scale. And again, this is you know, some obscure chemical that uh, you know, nobody's ever heard of uh, and yet is, uh, is profoundly distorting nature. Roads are strips of salt. You know, we add 20 million tons of road salt uh, as de-icers to American highways every year, uh, essentially creating ecological traps, right? Animals are drawn uh, to these salty strips. You know, wild animals are drawn to salt licks, and we've turned our transportation grid into one giant linear salt lick. Uh, which of course leads to conflicts, right? We're, again, we're luring animals in with the promise of resources uh, and then uh, killing them in the, in the process. Um, of course, the, the road salt conflict uh, did inspire my favorite road sign, um, which is that, which is uh, in Jasper National Park every winter, uh, they put up signs saying, do not let moose lick your car. Uh, I'm not sure you can stop a moose from licking your car. Uh, if, if a moose really wants to lick your car, it's probably going to do so. Um, but uh, again, this is, you know, this is what we've done to our highways. We've turned them into ecosystems in a sense, novel ecosystems. Uh, roads are also sort of these hellscapes of noise. Uh, you know, all of that engine and tire pollution bleeding into nature uh, creates a, a form of habitat loss uh, at a really large scale, right? A highway might only be 150 feet from shoulder to shoulder, and yet that sort of acoustic envelope can extend uh, for a couple of miles in, in either direction. And if you're uh, a songbird, uh, you know, who makes a living singing to attract mates, uh, well, if your song can't be uh, heard over the grumble of engines and tires, uh, you know, you functionally cannot live in that place. And I just wanted to show one quick 
video clip, if I may, uh, illustrating this concept of road noise as habitat loss, because I think it's not something that we often uh, think about. So the, the noise pollution from that ATV causes sort of an, an immediate uh, brown bear response, right? They flee the area. That's road noise is habitat loss. And I should add that road noise is also uh, elevating our blood pressures and heart rates and uh, our risk of cardiac disease and stroke and diabetes, right? Road noise is a, is a public health crisis as well as a, an ecological crisis. But it's not all doom and gloom. You know, roads also, again, create novel ecosystems in a sense. And animals have, uh, to some extent, adapted to this paved world that we've created. Uh, a few years ago in Minnesota, I, I visited a, a highway overpass uh, and uh, this enormous colony of little brown bats had taken up residence in the crevices uh, on the underside of the overpass uh, and essentially uh, adopted that as their, as their roost. So, you know, creatures uh, find ways of making a living in the novel ecosystems that we've created. Uh, another example of that uh, are pollinating insects, you know, in, in the American Midwest, where so much of the landscape is corn and soy monoculture. Uh, some of the last remnant strips of native prairie vegetation are those roadsides, uh, you know, the largest form of public land in many uh, Midwestern states and monarch butterflies and other insects have, have taken up residence. Uh, and roads are also these, again, linear trails of, of carcasses, essentially, too, right? And for, for scavengers like coyotes and magpies and ravens and golden eagles and bald eagles, uh, this, you know, roads have become a really important food source. But of course, again, a dangerous food source, right? If you're a, a bald eagle with a belly full of venison, it takes you a while to achieve liftoff uh, and uh, many eagles become roadkill. So again, the road operates as a, an ecological trap uh, in, in many instances. Uh, so I was when I, giving this talk. I was I was asked to uh, to talk a little bit about my own origins uh, or the the origins of my own interest in in this topic and how I how I came to uh, to road ecology uh, and to write a book about road ecology and you know talking about that is is isn't really my wheelhouse um, but I'll, I'll give it a shot anyway. Um, so you know as as uh, Natalie mentioned, I, I um, you know I graduated from the Yale School of, uh, of Forestry uh, back when it was called that, um, and I, I had uh, kind of a past life pre journalism as a wandering um, field ecology tech, basically, working for the National Park Service and uh, the New York City Parks and Recreation Department doing urban forestry work. Um, and you know, one of the positions I had was uh, tagging and studying sea turtles uh, in North Carolina. Uh, and you know, throughout all of, all of this work, uh, you know, roads were sort of the persistent background or an undercurrent uh, running through all of these different ecology and conservation issues uh, that I was working on in my, you know, a brief and aborted career as a, as a scientist, you know, sea turtles to name one example, um, you know, we were monitoring sea turtle nests in, uh, in North Carolina. Um, and, you know, one sort of persistent problem that came up over and over again is that, you know, when those baby sea turtles hatch, uh, they head towards the nearest source of light, which is usually the moon over the ocean, or at least historically that was the case for millions of years. Um, but now traffic lights and street lights lure them inland. So they go the wrong way and they end up in, uh, you know, in all of these suburban streets um, where, uh, of course, they die. So roads were, again, you know, even, even uh, you know, in, in, at this early stage in my career, kind of this, again, persistent background or, or undercurrent. And then, you know, when I became a journalist, uh, you know, my my specialty for a long time was wildlife conflict, essentially, all of the ways in which uh, humans and, and wild animals clash and uneasily attempt to coexist with each other. And I wrote lots of articles uh, about, you know, habitat connectivity and uh, conflict between livestock and large carnivores and, you know, suburban deer population control and, you know, coyote management. Uh, and again, you know, roads just kept coming up uh, over and over again as, as kind of the subtext or, or background, you know, as I put it uh, in, in my book, roads are the roots of all evil, right? R-O-U-T-E-S. Uh, they're kind of at the heart of all of the ways that humans penetrate wild landscapes and interact with, with, uh, with, with wild animals. Uh, and, you know, finally, uh, after you know, years of reporting on wildlife conflict, I had this 
formative experience um, where Rhodes went from being subtext to essentially text. I was writing about uh, habitat connectivity in the Northern Rockies, uh, and I had the opportunity to take a tour of, uh, of this network of wildlife crossings that had been constructed uh, on Highway 93 north of Missoula uh, in, in Montana. Uh, and, you know, these crossings, bridges, underpasses, tunnels uh, had been built to allow animals to safely navigate this very busy, dangerous highway. They'd been built uh, on the land of the uh, Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes. So the tribes kind of you know, flexed their legal and moral muscle and said to the state of Montana, look, you know, look, you need to build these structures to protect the animals that are foundational to our, our culture. And, and I had the opportunity to go up on one of these wildlife overpasses that the tribe had compelled the state to build. And it was just an incredibly moving and, and really beautiful experience. You know, I'd, I'd been writing for years about all of the things that we do uh, to make animals' lives harder and more dangerous. And here was this multi-million dollar piece of infrastructure um, that we had constructed to make their lives safer and easier. And I, I found that um, inspiring and also a fascinating intellectual challenge, right? How do you create a piece of infrastructure uh, that uh, you know a, a creature like an elk or a moose or a bobcat or a mink uh, is liable to use? Um, so I, I wrote, uh, you know, I wrote, I wrote a few articles about uh, about this this field of science, road ecology, that attempts to again sort of study how roads and nature interact. Um, the road scholar that's that was my headline idea, which I was really proud of. Um, and uh, over time, you know, after years of writing about this subject, uh, you know, that that journalism sort of culminated and came together uh, in this book that uh, that Natalie mentioned that just came out um, last month. So, you know, my my goal in, in writing this book, um, well, one of my goals uh, was to trace the history of road ecology, you know, this field of science that uh, I'm, I'm writing about um, in this book. And, you know, one of the fascinating things about road ecology um, I discovered as I as I delved into the historical literature is that, you know, it really emerges from this broader societal angst about cars in general. You know, we think about America as having this love affair with the car, right? That's a term that you hear a lot. Um, but in fact, you know, when cars first become prolific on the American landscape in the early 20th century, you know, most Americans hate cars. Uh, they're this fearsome new technology that's, you know, running people down in the street and displacing uh, all of the kids who are, you know, playing uh, stickball on Park Avenue. Uh, and, you know, there are all of these uh, sort of big, mass protests against cars and that's really where road ecology comes from you know all of the uh, all of these biologists say hey you know roads are roads and cars are, are really distorting urban life in the united states what are they doing to wild animals uh and you know that that's sort of again that social angst about cars and civilization and nature is reflected in some some early uh cartoons in the in the in the uh, in the 20th century this is the cover of uh Puck Magazine in, in uh, one issue in 1910. Um, I don't know how well you can see this image, but uh, this, this cartoon was called The Haunted Auto. And the motorist, as you can see, is being chased by the ghosts of all of the pigs and chickens and ducks and geese that he's run down, right? So from, the, from its earliest days, uh, you know, critics were considering uh, interactions between the automobile uh, and nature. Um, interestingly, I'll just, I'll just add that Puck Magazine also had a cover that same year, depicting roosters that had been run down in the road by a car. And I don't know if you can see this, but the 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 caption of that cartoon is, why does a chicken cross the road? Which I think might be the earliest reference uh, to that uh, iconic joke about uh, roads and animals. I think Puck Magazine might be the chicken road uh, originator. So again, you know, throughout, um, you know, the early sort of the, the 1920s, really, you know, all of these biologists are driving around, uh, you know, counting dead woodpeckers and ground squirrels and uh, and garter snakes uh, and sort of wringing their hands about what what cars are doing to nature and, you know, drawing these very explicit parallels, again, between how uh, the automobile is killing humans and how it's killing uh, wild animals. Uh, but, you know, by the uh, the 1930s, uh, basically what happens is that the car wins, right? The car has really 
powerful lobbyists, there are the auto companies themselves, there are the oil companies, there are the contractors who are building roads, there's the, you know, the federal government, the Bureau of Public Roads, which has a vested interest in creating all of these new high-speed transportation routes. Uh, and so, you know, the safety parades, you know, all of these protests against cars dry up and, you know, road ecology itself starts to dry up. Uh, you know, all of the all of the the biologists wringing their hands uh, about the uh, the impacts of cars on nature uh, sort of throw their hands up and say, well, essentially, you know, it's over. The car is won. Uh, you know, the idea of a safety campaign on behalf of wildlife is basically laughable. Uh, and you know, we we surrender in road ecology, this new field of science that again, um, you know, I mean, the term itself won't be coined until the 1990s. But all of these guys studying roads and nature, uh, that field of research seems is doomed to kind of wither on the vine before it uh, it even really gets going. Uh, but then in the, in the 1950s, it's it's revived, uh, and it's basically revived because of one animal, uh, which is deer, right? White-tailed deer and, and mule deer in the American West. You know, those are kind of our two species of deer uh, here in in the U.S. Uh, and it's funny to think that you know, that we, of course, deer are so ubiquitous today; they're all over the place. But, uh, you know, in the early 1900s, you would have been hard pressed to find a deer uh, in the United States. You know, they've been hunted um, nearly to extinction. And it's not until the middle of the 20th century that deer populations begin to rebound. And as deer recover, you know, all of these large 150 pound mammals are blundering into the paths of cars, driving uh, down the new interstate highways, uh, right? So Americans are driving farther and faster and more frequently than ever before. And all of a sudden, you know, there's this large animal getting in the way, endangering driver safety, right? You don't die when you hit a box turtle, but you know, you can die when you hit a white-tailed deer. Uh, and so there's this revival of interest in how roads and nature uh, interact, which again is really spawned by the white-tailed deer. And it's, you know, it's it's interesting to think that in its early days, again, you know, road ecology was very concerned with how cars were affecting wildlife. Um, but as deer proliferate, uh, the the roles reverse and you know lots of uh, biologists start to worry about how wildlife is affecting cars right now the animals are are sort of the problem uh, and uh, you know and, and cars are the the govern the the rulers of the landscape and any animals that are getting in the way of cars uh, start to be problematic and look there's you know there's there's no question that. Uh, you know, wildlife vehicle collisions, uh, deer vehicle collisions in particular, are a significant public health and safety crisis, uh, you know, one that we often overlook. Um, a few kind of amazing deer vehicle collision statistics that attest to this, uh, you know, there are between one and two million collisions between vehicles and deer uh, every year in the United States. Uh, deer is hit by a car every eight minutes in the state of New York alone. Uh, and these incidents are, are really uh, expensive and dangerous. Uh, you know, the average deer vehicle collision now costs society more than $9,000 uh, in hospital bills and vehicle repairs and insurance costs and tow trucks and, and so on. Uh, so, you know, these uh, these large animal collisions are costing uh, the United States more than $8 billion uh, every every year. Uh, and again, there are also very dangerous events, you know, between two and 400 drivers uh, are killed uh, in, in deer crashes every year. Uh, and I'd add that, you know, deer are not the only large dangerous creature on the landscape, right? The average elk collision costs more than $20,000. Uh, the average moose collision costs more than $40,000. Uh, uh, just as, a, as an aside, I was recently uh, in Alaska and I saw a musk ox uh, crossing the road. And I'm, I'm not sure that anybody's ever quantified the economic costs of musk ox collision, but that's definitely uh, an animal that you don't, you don't wanna hit. So, you know, again, really starting in the 1950s and, and early 60s, you know, as, as uh, deer and new interstate highways overlap, uh, you know, transportation departments and engineers around the country start to wonder, well, what do we do about this problem? How do we solve this, uh, this, this burgeoning deer vehicle collision crisis? And, you know, the first thing uh, that they try and really, you know, the, the default solution today uh, is the sign, right? This iconic classic yellow diamond with the leaping buck that we've all seen a, a million times. And I'll, you know, I'll, I'll tell you right now, 
it's there's lots of research showing that these signs are effectively useless. Uh, you know, there are so many of them on the on the landscape. They're essentially visual pollution to us. They're white noise that we uh, you know see constantly and and thus uh, essentially ignore. You know, often you see this sort of sign. Uh, you know, deer crossing next thirty miles. Obviously, no driver is going to remain alert uh, to uh, to to leaping deer for thirty miles, right? Um, and yet, because uh, you know, these, these, you know, because they're so cheap and easy to install, uh, you know, they're a very simple expression of concern that transportation departments can put up and basically say, look, we're aware of this problem and we're doing something about it in the form of an animal sign. And so you see these signs all over the place. I was recently in Texas writing about uh, ocelot conservation and there are ocelot crossing signs everywhere, um, which again is a, you know, it's a, it's a cheap public expression of concern um, that is, is functionally not helpful. Uh, I've heard biologists call signs uh, litter on sticks, which I think, uh, you know, kind of gets at their uselessness nicely. And I'd also point out that, you know, that look, signs address wildlife collisions, but they don't do anything about the other half of the problem, right? Which is that roads are preventing animals from getting the, to the places they need to go to. You know, it's not just that animals are getting hit by cars, it's that they're getting blocked from accessing habitat by the endless stream of cars, right? What some biologists have called this moving fence uh, of, traffic, of traffic that functionally uh, acts as habitat loss. And I just wanted to show one quick video that illustrates this concept, right? How difficult it is for animals to cross roadways um, and have signs, you know, really don't address that problem at all. So this is a, a quick video from a, a, a highway in Wyoming. Um, and I'll just I'll just tell you right now that no animals are killed in the in the uh, in the course of this video, so don't worry about that. Um, spoiler. But you know you can just see how incredibly difficult it is, right, for for uh, for deer to cross this highway. And this is look at this is not this is not I eighty right. This is not a, a busy interstate highway. This is a quiet two lane uh, highway in rural Wyoming that is nonetheless too trafficked to permit animals to move freely across the landscape. Uh, and in fact, road ecologists have written that roads with more than 10,000 vehicles per day uh, should be considered absolute barriers to wildlife. Uh, and you know, for reference, that's basically every major highway in America, right, has more than 10,000 cars, cars per day. So we've, we've essentially constructed these impenetrable walls of traffic uh, all over the landscape. And you know, a couple of quick case studies that illustrate why that's such a big problem. Um, you know, so one one chapter of this book is about uh, mule deer in Wyoming and mule deer, kind of white-tailed deer, sister species, a Western species uh, that has to migrate across large distances to find resources in, in harsh climates like Wyoming. Uh, and what researchers have found is that uh, major highways are basically complete barriers to their movement, right? Here's I don't know how clear this image is, but this is basically uh, a map of mule deer um, winter habitat use. Uh, and you can see that I-80 here, this, you know, this uh, linear strip at the bottom of the screen is essentially a complete barrier to their movement, right? They just pull up against that highway looking for an opportunity to cross, but are unable to do so. And some years they starve en masse as a result of that, uh, that, that habitat loss. You know, they're trying to find their low elevation, snow-free winter range, uh, but they can't cross that highway uh, and you know, perish in, in large numbers as a result. And in some ways that's worse than roadkill itself, right? A, a herd of mule deer can handle a few collisions, a few animals getting hit. What they can't handle is losing access to all of that habitat. And of course, it's not just mule deer, right? Here's a, a um, another map of uh, of an animal's satellite collar points and a map of animal movement. This is the uh, the map created by uh, a grizzly bear in Montana uh, that basically spent two years trying to cross I-90. Each of these red X's is a point where that bear uh, approached the highway and then bounced off it like a ping pong ball, uh, repelled by that uh, you know that impenetrable wall of traffic. And, you know, and, and again, this habitat fragmentation created by busy freeways uh, is a true existential threat uh, to, to uh, many wildlife species and, and populations. Uh, here's another, another map illustrating that point. This is a map of, uh, of mountain lion uh, movements uh, near Los Angeles. There's this little population of mountain lions just outside of LA. 
Uh, and uh, you can see that, so each, each color is, you know, the movements of a single mountain lion. Uh, and you can see that the 101, which is basically the busiest freeway in America, is essentially a complete barrier to mountain lion movement, right? No animals cross that freeway. Uh, and as a result, you know, they're essentially insularized. You know, they're stuck on this little island of habitat and no new mountain lions can enter the population because of this freeway wall. Uh, and what researchers have found is that, you know, those that little population of mountain lions living in this island in the Santa Monica Mountains uh, has become chronically inbred as a result, right? They're stuck mating with their own daughters and granddaughters and great granddaughters because fresh blood can't enter the gene pool. And they've entered what's known as an extinction vortex, this long-term doom spiral, essentially, uh, if nothing is, is done to, uh, to, to help them. So, you know, again, it's not just the collisions, right? It's also this, this barrier effect, which is in some ways even, even worse. So, you know, the, the really the best tool that we have at our disposal to deal with these sorts of conflicts uh, is wildlife crossings, right? Again, these overpasses, underpasses, tunnels uh, that allow animals to cross highways safely. Uh, you know, wildlife crossings really uh, are originally a European innovation. You know, countries like France, Germany, Switzerland, Austria, uh, you know, built, built the first ones in the 1950s and 60s and early 70s. Uh, the Netherlands is really the world's leader at this point in the construction of wildlife crossings. Um, the place that they've, you know, that they've probably become most famous is in Banff National Park uh, in Canada, which is sort of split in half by the, uh, the Trans-Canada Highway. Uh, there, there are around 40 wildlife crossings that were built during the 1980s, 90s, and early 2000s. Um, you know, the target species in Banff is really grizzly bears, which, you know, like mountain lions near Los Angeles, are genetically fragmented by this giant highway running through the middle of the park. Um, and, you know, Banff is really the place where, uh, you know, a lot of the great wildlife crossing and road ecology science emerged, where it was proven quite definitively uh, that animals all kinds of different species, you know, use these structures very happily, cross back and forth. Uh, you know, grizzly bears were, again, one of the target species here. Um, and uh, there's, you know, some great studies conducted basically showing that, you know, that grizzly bears cross the road using these structures. Uh, they mate on either side. They cross back. They teach their cubs to become crossers themselves. There's really this intergenerational uh, phenomenon where you know knowledge of how to use these crossings is transmitted, uh, you know, throughout throughout populations, uh, which is uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, you know, in the U.S., uh, you know, most of the early crossings uh, are built in Western states like Utah, Wyoming, Colorado, where these, you know, there are these big uh, migrations of mule deer and elk and antelope and, you know, other animals that have to roam long distances and frequently cross highways and, you know, get killed en masse as a result of that. So, you know, a lot of the early crossings are built for, for these, these Western species in, in Western states. Um, and, you know, over time, uh, you know, road ecologists very quickly learn how to make these structures effective. And, you know, one of the really important features are fences, right? People always ask, how do the animals know to use the crossings? And the answer is basically fences direct them to the crossings, right? The, you know, the big, beautiful overpasses get a lot of attention, but, you know, it's the humble fence uh, that really, uh, you know, makes these, these structures work. Uh, I'll add that these, you know, jump outs are helpful too, right? These one-way escape ramps. So if an animal somehow penetrates the fence and gets caught on the highway, uh, you know, these escape ramps uh, help them help them get out of the corridor. So you know, these the fencing components are a really important uh, part of this whole this whole system. Uh, and you know, uh, one of the the innovations that uh, you see increasingly frequently now in the road ecology space. Uh, is providing a diversity of different crossing types, right? Every animal has a different niche and different habitat requirements and, you know, need different crossing structures as a result. You know, there are some species that much prefer overpasses. There are some that much prefer underpasses. Uh, you know, there are some that follow stream corridors, right? So you, you need, you know, you need crossings at streams. Uh, you know, you really need to account for the entire diversity, again, of, of species uh, within, within ecosystems. And I'll just show one crit, one quick video um, illustrating that point. This is a, a series of videos from uh, Snoqualmie Pass on I-90 near Seattle, where they built uh, about 20 different crossing structures, each of them a little bit um, individual, uh, and uh, you know, have, have sort of managed to get the entire diversity of species uh, in this ecosystem uh, across I-90, this incredibly busy freeway um, as a result. 
I did not choose this music. Otters, I think that's pretty cool. Anyway, get the gist. Uh, you know, so I mean, one one common objection to wildlife crossings that uh, you know you still hear is that look, they're expensive, right? Now the average uh, wildlife overpass costs between five and ten million dollars, right? So these structures aren't necessarily cheap. Although in the context of transportation budgets, that's really not a, a whole lot of money. Uh, but you know, I think that the the uh, you know one important point about these structures is that, is that they actually they pay for themselves pretty quickly, right? By again preventing all of these dangerous, expensive, uh, large animal crashes. Uh, you know, these 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 crossings really rec recoup their own construction costs very rapidly. Um, one example of that, this is a wildlife crossing uh, near Pinedale, Wyoming, that was built primarily for uh, for pronghorn antelope. Uh, and, you know, this is a multi-million dollar structure, uh, you know, lots of um, gnashing of teeth about spending a few million dollars on antelope. Um, but of course, you know, this structure prevents uh, something like 50 crashes every year and uh, you know paid for its own construction um again within about five years right so these you know these these sorts of crossings are, are actually um you know really uh, really good fiscal policy as well as conservation policy the the only limitation with that right is that you know you know we have tended in this country in this country at least to build crossings that benefit large animals that are dangers to driver safety, right? If the goal of a wildlife crossing is to recoup its own construction costs uh, by preventing crashes, uh, well, that means you're gonna build lots of crossings for deer and elk and moose, uh, and probably not many for frogs and turtles and snakes and rodents, right? Small animals often get overlooked uh, in, uh, in wildlife crossing construction, at least in, in the US, because transportation departments do often have this requirement that crossings prevent crashes, right? And you've never, nobody's ever totaled their car by you know, hitting a few uh, red-legged frogs. Um, but you know, other, other countries are, I think, a little bit more progressive or at least conservation-minded about their uh, wildlife crossings. There's a, a very famous crossing for crabs uh, on Christmas Island, this big sort of horde of, of uh, migratory red crabs. Um, Australia builds lots of uh, ar arboreal crossings, these rope bridges for species like squirrel gliders. Uh, and look, you know, we have plenty of uh, arboreal species in the U.S., right? We have pine martens and porcupines and flying squirrels that would also benefit um, from structures like these. Uh, but, you know, we tend not to build them, uh, again, because we're, you know, we have thus far at least been, I think, more focused on driver safety than, uh, than, than conservation, which is, you know, again, an understandable perspective for a transportation department, um, but, you know, means that a lot of uh, road imperiled species uh, tend to get left out. Um, you know, we're also in the process of trying to build more ambitious crossings in some ways. You know, the most famous example being a crossing that's being uh, constructed over the 101 in, in Los Angeles for those mountain lions I mentioned earlier. And this this crossing will be completed by 2025 and will be, uh, you know, the largest and, and uh, certainly most ambitious and expensive uh, wildlife crossing in, in the U.S. It's going to span 12 lanes of traffic and 300,000 cars every day. Uh, and so, you know, if you can build a wildlife crossing over the 101, right, you can build one uh, basically anywhere. So, you know, we need to start, uh, I think, scaling up the scope and ambition of some of these projects. And, you know, this is uh, the 101 is a good a good start. Uh, happily, we're about to uh, to get many more wildlife crossings in this country. You know, the 2021 Infrastructure Act had a something called the Wildlife Crossings Pilot Program, a $350 million uh, pot of funding specifically for wildlife crossings, you know, certainly the most money that's ever been spent on animal friendly infrastructure uh, at, at one time. Uh, and yeah, that's look, that sounds like a lot of money um, in the context of the transportation or of the infrastructure act, you know, which had, which had 100, $110 billion for road and bridge upgrades, you know, $350 million is really not, not all that money. It's a truly a drop in the bucket. So, you know, we're, we're making progress. We're funding these sorts of solutions uh, more than we have in the past, but, you know, we still have a, a very long way to go uh, if we're going to deal with the many, many thousands of, uh, of, of problem spots uh, around, uh, around the country. 
Uh, also add that, you know, fish need safe passage as well, right? The Infrastructure Act has a billion dollars for culvert retrofits. You know, culverts are all of those little inconspicuous pipes that funnel streams under, under roads. There's something like 2 million culverts in America, all of these intersections between transportation infrastructure and waterways. And each one of those is a potential barrier to fish migration. Uh, and, you know, in, in the Northwest in particular, uh, salmon have lost thousands of miles of, uh, of access to spawning habitat because faulty culverts uh, have prevented them from migrating. Uh, and, you know, we need to deal with those, those problem areas as well. So roads are a, you know, crisis for aquatic connectivity uh, as well as terrestrial connectivity. Uh, and again, the Infrastructure Act has a billion dollars um, for, uh, for culvert repairs and replacements. It's also got $250 million for road decommissioning. You know, we think of roads as being these permanent and inevitable features on the landscape. But in fact, the US Forest Service, which has around 400,000 miles of roads uh, in its ambit is you know, currently in the very gradual process of obliterating some of those old roads that uh, you know, don't receive much traffic, um, but you know, frequently erode and smother uh, fish spawning habitat. Um, so, you know, we're in the process, again, very, very slowly, much too slowly, uh, of unmaking some of the infrastructure um, that, uh, you know, is, it has proven disastrous to nature. So again, you know, the task before us is, is truly to remake that infrastructure to save biodiversity, you know, infrastructure, roads in particular, is, is truly one of the, the primary causes of this sixth mass extinction event that we're we are in the middle of and and uh, you know we we uh, have this very narrow window of opportunity created by a lot of new federal funding uh, to kind of rebuild some of the uh, the the especially problematic structures we've created uh, and uh, you know it's imperative that we we do so this is a, an ocelot wildlife crossing uh, that I, I visited uh, in in Texas so, you know, because this uh, this this talk is uh, sponsored in part by uh, law students, you know, I just wanted to conclude with a, just a very quick legal perspective um, about, you know, why it's so important to remake our infrastructure and, and you know, why it's really our responsibility. Uh, so one of the places that I visited in working on this book uh, is Brazil. And, you know, Brazil is, uh, of course, the most biodiverse country in the world. It's also a country that's building infrastructure very rapidly. And, you know, those those two forces, biodiversity and infrastructure, uh, we know now are, are at odds. This is a, a, a tapir uh, wildlife uh, or a tapir roadkill that I, I came across in, uh, in, in Brazil. Uh, and, you know, in, in the U.S., we, we tend to consider roadkill essentially an, an act of God, right? It's, you know, just something that kind of happens. Uh, it's this inevitable fact of, of, uh, of modern life that we can't really uh, avoid. But, you know, the, the amazing Brazilian innovation that I, I really love, legal innovation, is that in Brazil, uh, it's actually possible to sue road operators for damages incurred in animal collisions. Uh, you know, Brazil has lots of private concessionaires who run their highways. Uh, and, you know, if you, if you hit a tapir and, and uh, you know, smash up your car, uh, you can actually sue the road operator uh, on the grounds that, look, we know that we can prevent these collisions, right? We know that fences and wildlife crossings work, and it should be your responsibility to construct those things uh, to prevent these collisions, right? So roads are not, uh, road, road kill and wildlife collisions are not an inevitable fact of life, they're actually an infrastructural failure, uh, which I, I think is a, a great sort of shift in perspective. And I was talking to this woman named Fernanda Abra, who's a great road ecologist uh, in Brazil. And she was she told me a story, her, her, one of her friends had recently uh, hit a fox uh, and actually done some damage to her car hitting a fox. And, you know, her friend was crying uh, and Fernanda said, hey, you should you should call the police to report this, uh, you know, this incident so that you can be compensated for it. Uh, and, you know, she didn't want money. Uh, you know, her conscience was heavy. She thought it was her fault that she hit the fox, right? It's the driver's responsibility uh, for killing animals. Um, but, you know, as Fernanda Abra, this road ecologist pointed out, that is a failure in their service, right? That, you know, that is a that is an incident that the road operator is capable of preventing through retrofits uh, and its failure to do so makes it culpable and, uh, and liable. Uh, and there's actually some precedent for this idea of road operator liability in the US. Uh, there's this, uh, there's, a, there's a great case in 2004, Booth versus Arizona, this guy, Jerry Booth uh, hit an elk 
uh, on an interstate, uh, or maybe it was maybe it's a federal highway. Anyway, this guy hit an inter Jerry Booth hit an elk uh, somewhere in Arizona, uh, and uh, you know did uh, total his car and did a lot of um, re really injured uh, in the incident as well. And he ended up suing the state of Arizona uh, again on the grounds that they should have kept kept that elk off the highway. Uh, and you know at trial, uh, you know one of his expert witnesses testified that look, other states in Canada have used these fences and underpasses to get elk and other animals off the highway, right? And therefore it is, you know, again, the responsibility of transportation agencies to prevent these, uh, you know, these problematic incidents. And in this case, uh, Jerry Booth actually won $3 million um, from the state of Arizona for their failure to prevent this, this collision. Um, so again, you know, roadkill, wildlife vehicle collisions, it, it is not just an act of God. It's not something that inevitably happens in modernity. It is truly an infrastructural failure uh, that we know how to prevent. We have the power to prevent it. Uh, and we increasingly, uh, although not quite enough, uh, have funding to prevent it. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll just say again, you know, if this uh, conversation just whet your appetite for uh, road ecology, um, I do have this new book that just came out uh, last month called Crossings. Uh, both the New York Times and uh, the Wall Street Journal, among many other publications, uh, have uh, reviewed it really favorably. So, you know, liberals and conservatives coming together uh, to embrace this uh, this topic, which is uh, always, always exciting to see. Um, and uh, with that, I'll, I'll say uh, thank you guys so much for your uh, attention, and I'm happy to take some questions.